We're continuing our studies in the book of Colossians. We're still in chapter 1, and this morning we're going to look at verses 21 through 23. Paul began speaking about reconciliation in the previous passage. We looked at that last week when we looked uh, at verse 20. And he speaks of um, the reconciliation of the, the universe through the work of Christ and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And then we read in verse 21, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body, through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister." May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. One of the great hymn writers of Christianity and one of the great poets of England was William Cooper. He had a troubled youth. He was physically frail and emotionally fragile. He grieved over his mother's death. He despaired over his failures, he tried to hang himself and was committed to an asylum. But there he read the Bible, and when he came to Romans chapter 3, verse 25, that Jesus Christ was set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, he believed and was converted. He later expressed his gratitude for grace in the hymn, There is a Fountain, that begins, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. It's a favorite hymn of Christians, but that's a startling image, isn't it? Being submerged in a flood of blood. It's disturbing to many and adds to Voltaire's criticism that Christianity is a bloody religion. Blood makes people faint. Blood sacrifices seem primitive and barbaric to modern man. And he wants a bloodless religion and forgiveness without cost. But the Bible is clear. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so all through the Bible, we see bloody sacrifices of bulls and goats and lambs being led to the altar. The temple was a slaughterhouse with blood flowing every day, morning and evening. But not even that could take away man's sins. It only presaged and pictured the final sacrifice, the only effective sacrifice sacrifice, that of the God-man, Jesus Christ, and the cross. Then after the cross, we read statements in the Bible that sound very much like Cooper's hymn. Statements like, they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Paul connects all of the doctrines of salvation to the blood of Christ. That statement that was so influential in Cooper's conversion, Romans 3 verse 25, is just one example that God displayed Christ publicly as a propitiation. Propitiation is one of the great words of the Bible. It means very simply to satisfy. God's justice was satisfied in the sacrifice of His Son. His wrath was exhausted and turned away in the cross. That's the reason that Paul could write 
in our previous passage in Colossians chapter 1 verse 20, that through him, through his son, God would reconcile all things to himself through the blood of his cross. Reconciliation is another of the great words in the Bible that is at the heart of the gospel, at the heart of, at the, heart of the good news of salvation, and it means to make peace. It's based on propitiation because God's justice has been satisfied through the blood of Christ. He is now free to reconcile, to make peace between himself and man. Uh, the Greek word for reconcile or reconciliation is from the word for change. So it means to change from hostility to friendship, from war to peace, or as some like to say, from enmity to amity. In verse 20, Paul is referring to cosmic changes in, in the future, when the universe will be released from what Paul calls in Romans 8, verse 20, its futility and be liberated into glory. But that freedom and, and future is based on the reconciliation God has already established with man. That's what Paul describes in some detail in the next verses, verses 21 and 22. The Colossians were now reconciled with God. They were at peace with Him. But in the past, they were at war. So Paul recalls their past to remind them of the need they had to be reconciled to God and of the greatness of God's grace that brought them into that relationship with him. You, he writes, were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. Now that is mankind today. It is the consequence of the events that occurred in the garden that are recorded in Genesis 3 when man broke his covenant with God to obey and instead disobeyed and fell. We've all inherited Adam's guilt because he was our representative. The best man, the perfect man stood for us. We couldn't have had a better person to represent us he was a perfect man. We couldn't have had a better situation. He was in a perfect environment. We couldn't have had a better situation because he had only one prohibition. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All those other trees are for you. Eat, enjoy. Just one prohibition. We couldn't have had a better man, a perfect man. We couldn't have had a better situation. And yet, he fell he failed. And so when he failed and he fell, we fell with him. As our representative goes, so we all go. And now mankind is in ruins and the rebellion continues. Man, men and women, mankind is alienated from God. Sin has separated us from him. Paul said this of the Ephesians, that they had been separated from God's promises and they were without hope in the world. That's a desperate situation. That's man apart from God's saving grace. As a result, men, have, men lead what F.F. F. Bruce described as lonely lives in a universe which is felt to be unfriendly. And that is so true. What? It's, it's, it is a lonely, unfriendly place because men are not only separated from God, that's the fundamental separation, but because of that, they're also separated from one another. They're at odds with one another. Men are at war with each other. They are, as Paul describes the Colossians here, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. We may not like that description, People may take offense to say that that's true of all of us. But it's what the Scriptures teach, and it's what men have, have observed. I think men have, have, who know history have, can't escape that fact. Edward, Edward Gibbon, in his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, wrote that history is indeed little more 
than the register of the crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. That's a pretty dismal look at history. What a sad world. But that is what alienation, separation from God produces. Man's crimes are really only the outworking of his rebellion against God. He is hostile in mind toward him. Now that's what we see here. We see it other places. Uh, Paul's explanation of the human condition is stated pretty clearly in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7. The mind set on the flesh, he wrote, that is the mind, the natural mind, the unbelieving mind of man. That mind is hostile toward God for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to do so. It's in rebellion. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It refuses to subject itself to the law of God. You see that, but also it's not even able to do so. That's the crowning statement that he makes. Man cannot submit to God, and so he will not submit to God. He is a rebel by nature. That's man's spiritual condition. He is guilty and helpless to change, and he's determined not to change. Ah, but what man cannot do and does not want to do, God does. He brings about change. And these Colossians experienced it, as every believer in Jesus Christ has. You were alienated, he said. You were hostile... Yet, He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death. That's grace. That's God's undeserved love and favor. He brought them near who were far off. He changed those who were enemies and made them friends. He ended the war and He established peace. These Colossians understood that. They heard the good news that God's messengers gave, the offer of peace, the promise of forgiveness and eternal life. They, they felt the burden of, of guilt and the emptiness of life without hope and responded to the light of the gospel by believing it. They trusted in the Savior. There is no salvation apart from that, no salvation apart from faith. You must believe. But... God took the initiative. Paul states that here and elsewhere. Romans 5, for example, he said, While you were still helpless, God, or Christ died for the ungodly. While you were unable and unwilling, helpless and ungodly, Christ died for you. While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. That's grace. He died to save us while we were in the very act of war against Him. I think it was the Scottish theologian and preacher P.T. Forsyth who said that Christ took us with weapons in our hands. It's a good statement and a very accurate picture. Paul knew that very well. He was on his way to Damascus to jail or kill Christians. He had letters in his hand uh, that gave him the authority to do that from the high priest when Christ stopped him in his tracks. Christ arrested Paul, Saul of Tarsus, in the very act of hostility against him and changed him completely from an enemy to a friend, from a persecutor to an apostle and evangelist. Conversions may be more spectacular in some than in others, but all are really the same. They are a change from war to peace. All of us were captured with weapons in our hands. God did it all. But He did it at great cost to Himself. It was peace established through the blood of His cross. Here, Paul says He reconciled us in His fleshly body through death. And it was a 
violent death. It was a bloody death because it was a sacrificial death. But the emphasis here is on the genuine human nature of Christ. That He died as a man, as a representative man, but He died as a man. The sacrifice of a bull or goat couldn't atone for our sins and satisfy God's justice. Fountains of blood had flowed for centuries without taking away sin. Only a man could die in the place of men. Only a man could die in the place of mankind. Just as one man brought us down, one man raised us up. Because when Christ died, He stood in our place in judgment and He suffered for our sins. In our place. So this peace between us and God happened in His fleshly body. In the, the, the real body of a real man with a reasonable soul. And by His death. That's what gives the assurance that He established permanent peace with God. Our sins have all been paid for in full. His death is sufficient and it's more than sufficient. The the slate that was inscribed with our crimes has been wiped clean by the sacrifice of Christ. They, They can never again be raised against us. But that is the real problem the natural man, the unbelieving man has. It's it's not only the bloody sacrifice. It's not simply that it seems barbaric to modern man. It's, It's the sin for which the blood was shed. The sin for which the man died. That's the problem. Man chafes at the suggestion that he's a sinner that he is guilty, that he's unworthy, and that he's helpless. He denies it all. As long ago as as 1939, Reinhold Niebuhr, no conservative, by the way, wrote of the complacent conscience of modern man. That's really the problem. Man doesn't think he's sinful. He thinks he's okay. He doesn't believe in in the fall or original sin. He has a complacent conscience about guilt and judgment. The dying words of the German poet Heinrich Heine are often quoted as giving expression to the natural man's religion. He lived a pretty rough life, the poet did. But as he was dying, he said, God will forgive me, that is his business. No, God cannot offer amnesty to rebels. He cannot simply forgive and dismiss sin. God is holy. God is just. He must deal with sin and evil rightly, justly. He must punish it. He must pay for it in order to remove it. That's the reason Christ died. We've said it before, I know, But um, if there had been any other way for God to save mankind, for, for God to wipe the slate clean, for Him to gain forgiveness for us, God would have let the cup pass from Him, from His only begotten Son. And He didn't do that. And the reason He didn't do that is because there is no other way to satisfy His justice and remove His wrath and establish peace any other way than through the blood of His cross. Now that was even indicated at the very beginning when God mercifully clothed Adam and Eve with animal skins before expelling them from the garden. To cover their shame, he had to slay animals. They witnessed this. They witnessed something they'd never seen before that must have shocked, horrified them when he slew two animals to clothe them. They shed blood. Well, men can attack Christianity as a bloody religion and excuse their unbelief in that way, but the Bible is clear. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, and that 
has been witnessed to and declared from the beginning and will be to the end. Christ won the peace, but it was a bloody peace. Now that's not because God is cruel or barbaric, but because, because sin is so evil and so damning that it took the blood of the Son of God, the God-man, to remove it. The problem of modern man is the problem that an old English divine medieval theologian Anselm spoke of when he addressed the man he was debating and he said this man had a difficult time with the uh, atonement, the death of Christ as a substitute. He didn't believe it. And so Anselm got to the real point of his problem. He says, you have not yet considered how great the weight of sin is. Your problem is you don't understand how bad sin is. That's so true. The sin of man is so great, that the stain of sin is so deep that only the blood of Christ can remove it. And that is effective. Christ's sacrifice. It is cleansing. And it is abundant. Not for a few, but a multitude. It is like a flood of grace and an ocean of salvation. So, we who have, <clears throat> have been washed in it, gladly sing, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. We are free from sin's penalty. And that penalty is great. It's eternal. It is eternal wrath that we have been saved from. Eternal darkness from which we have been saved. And we are free from its power. Yes, we still sin, but sin's power is broken and, and we're being presently at this moment sanctified and someday we will be free altogether from sin's presence and be glorified. Now that's the promise that Paul gives in the rest of the verse. Christ has reconciled us to God in order to present you, in order to present all of us, every believer, before Him, before His Father, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That's our future. In the present, right now, we are justified. We are legally right with Him. We have full forgiveness now. And the result is we have peace with God and we have open access to Him. Because we're declared righteous, because we're legally right with Him, we have the freedom to come to Him at any moment, every moment. But then, in the future, we will be actually sinless. That's what Paul means in this, this, uh, that first description, holy. Uh, the basic idea of holy is separation. It, 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 it uh, means unmixed. Um, that was taught to Israel all through the law of Moses. In their diet, in their dress, in their calendar, all through you see separation. They could eat lamb but not pork. There were clean and unclean animals, clean and unclean food. They could wear clothing of wool or they could wear clothing of cotton, but they couldn't mix the fabrics. They, they were to separate them. It, it was all designed to teach them. This was everything in their life was, was an object lesson to teach them to be pure, to be holy, to be separated from sin and devoted to God. So it, this idea of holiness is separation, basically. Separate, separated from what is wrong, but also separated to, devoted to God. In the future day, we will be holy, is what Paul is saying. Christ will come, the graves will be opened, the bodies of the saints will be raised pure and glorified physically and spiritually. That's our hope, that's our future. And so, we will be blameless and beyond reproach. That's not so today. 
We are righteous, but as the Reformers put it, we're righteous sinners. We still sin. We are inconsistent in our lives, and people can point to us as being far from blameless and accuse us of hypocrisy. And we can't deny that. In fact, we have an accuser, Satan. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren, and he, he accuses us before God day and night. Revelation 12, verse 10. It is constant, it is relentless, and it's convincing. And I say it's convincing because it's true. Everything he says is true. He doesn't need to, he's a liar from the beginning, Jesus said, and a murderer. But he doesn't need to lie about us. He can just point to the things we do continually. Because we do sin. That's Paul's frustration in Romans chapter 7. The good that he wanted to do, he didn't do. He practiced the very evil that he didn't want to do. But there is an antidote to Satan's attacks, and that is the blood of the Lamb. It's by the Lord's sacrifice that we overcome the evil one. Because all of the sins that Satan can raise up and accuse us of have all been dealt with, all been paid for. The debt has been wiped out. And because of that, the day is coming when sin and failure of every kind will be a thing of the past and forever forgotten. It won't haunt us anymore. We will stand before God holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That will be Glorious and joyful, that will be a, a glorious and euphoric day. All a thing of the past, as I say, forgotten. In the present, Paul told the Corinthians, our outer man is decaying. We don't lose heart, he said, because while, we are, while it is decaying, our, our inner man is being renewed day by day. So the outer man's decaying, on its way to dust, but the inner man is going in just the opposite direction. It's being renewed. That's sanctification. But still, the, the decay of the outer man is the effect of sin, and it's not easy. It's not easy for the saints. It's not easy for us. It's debilitating. It's discouraging. Youth and strength pass by once and never are recovered. Someone said, youth is wasted on the young. They don't appreciate it. They don't know what they've got. And before you know it, it's gone, and then they appreciate it. Well, that's true for, that's true for all of us. It's not easy to get old. But that is a, 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 the particularly dreary reality for the man or woman of the world the unbelieving person. Their strength and beauty goes quickly and it's gone forever. They'll never recover. it. But the saint will be restored and glorified forever. The youth that we lost will be, what we will receive will be far greater than that. Our minds will be expanded. Our minds will be healed. Charles Spurgeon suffered from depression just as Winston Churchill did. Churchill called it black dog. Spurgeon called it fainting fits. All kinds of reasons were given for the fainting fits that Spurgeon had, but his wife thought the weather in England affected him. Maybe it did. He would take off and spend a lot of time in the south of France where the weather was better, but he, he had a different explanation. He called these fainting fits soul sickness. The brain, he thought, was as broken by the fall as the body. The troubled man experiences a good deal, he said, not because he is a Christian, but because he is a man, a sickly man, a man inclined toward melancholy. It's just part of the fall. We all suffer physically and mentally. We suffer all kinds of issues due to the fall, but that will be changed someday. We will be made whole. We will be made pure. Body, mind, and soul. That's what we look forward to. We, like the Ephesians and the Colossians, were without hope in the world. 
But now we have hope. It is permanent. It is certain. Because it is based on the work of Christ, the Son of God. It is based on the blood of Christ. Now, Paul gives a caveat to this in verse 23. He warns they have this hope if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Why the if? Was it because Paul was afraid the Colossians might lose their faith and lose their salvation? No. If, if he meant that, then he would contradict the rest of Scripture. He'd contradict himself and the things that he said. We've taught on this often, the, the security of the believer, the assurance that the believer has of salvation, of eternal security. We, we speak of the perseverance of the saints, that they will persevere to the end, the saints will. It's probably better to speak of it as the perseverance of the Savior because He keeps us saved. He supplies us constantly with faith. He promised us eternal life. Well, if, if that eternal life can be lost, it's not eternal life. If words mean anything, and then eternal life means it's eternal. It's not temporal. And he says, they, that is his sheep, they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Paul's not contradicting that. I don't know how you can get more absolute and clear than the statements that, that Jesus made in John chapter 10. But Paul would be, as I said, contradicting himself as well. Because Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. And he gives a list of all kinds of things that cannot separate us. Nothing. There are many verses in Scripture that assure the believer that he or she is secure in Christ. We, we have been sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption, Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.30. Paul's not suggesting anything contrary to that. In fact, this conditional sentence actually indicates his confidence in them. It has the sense of, if you continue in the faith, and I believe you will. So the way he structures the sentence, the way he states it, is a way of affirming his assurance, his confidence in them. So why the if? I think there are two reasons. The first is due to the reality that there are always people in churches mixed with the saints who profess faith but have never possessed faith. It's the parable of the soils in the Gospels. There, there is seed that falls on rocky soil. It's the Gospel. That seed represents the gospel. And it's received originally, initially, with joy, but doesn't have firm root in that heart, in that soil. And because of affliction, or various things, the person falls away. Maybe affliction, as I say, or worldliness, or false teaching that tests their profession of faith and proves it false. John referred to this in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19, which really gives us the source of the problem that John was addressing in, in that book. He said, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. This is a company of people that had been with them in this church that John was writing to and had been with them evidently for some time, and then they'd left. They denied things. They, they'd been part of the visible church, but they'd moved away from the foundation of the faith. They'd moved away from Christ alone. They'd moved away from the gospel for a different message, a false one. That happens. It, it was Bunyan's character, ignorance in uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, who told Christian and Hopeful that he was going to the celestial city and he was confident that he would enter because he said, I have been a good liver. 
They warned him a person can only enter the way by the wicked gate, by the cross. But he said he would follow the religion of his own country and continue on and continued on by himself, confident that he'd enter. Well, the book concludes with Christian and Hopeful entering the city and ignorance being bound and taken away and Bunyan ends. Then I saw that there was a way to hell even from the gates of heaven. We can get very close to the truth and not enter. Paul knew that too and wrote this if because the Colossians' faith was being tested with a false gospel a works gospel. And he knew some of them were enamored of it and flirting with it. So this was a reminder to them that the saints, the saved, are those who finally persevere. Continuance in the faith is the proof of reality. A believer doesn't move away from hope in Christ alone. Now, I can't know that a person professing faith is not saved. I don't know a person's heart. Uh, so I can't tell a person, you are not a Christian. You are not saved. There may be something going on that's temporary in their life that I don't understand. But neither can I give the encouragement of salvation to a person who is in disagreement with the gospel and in disobedience to Scripture. What I can give is a warning, and through that warning, a false believer may wake up. It's the only way he will wake up or she will wake up is if they hear the warning and they hear the gospel. That's the first reason for the if. And warnings are a means of perseverance. That, that's the second reason for the if. Warnings stop those who are drifting and cause a person cause the elect, cause those who have ears to hear to strive even more in the faith. Then there are some people who need to be encouraged more than warned. People who struggle with assurance because of their nature or temperament. Some people are prone to that. Our, our great hymn writer, William Cooper, was like that. Like Churchill and Spurgeon, Cooper suffered from depression, what would be called today clinical depression. He struggled with it all of his Christian life. We, we want to think of a sort of happily ever after scenario for the Christian. He goes through this suicidal tendencies. He has terrible depression as a young man. He becomes a Christian and all's well. Well, all was well, but he struggled throughout his life. He was helped greatly by his close friend, John Newton. They wrote hymns together and they gloried in the grace of God. But then Cooper would be overwhelmed with doubt and despair and felt certain that he was a castaway. He wrote a poem called The Castaway. Well, that can be due to a lot of things. That may be due to the, the devil's fiery darts. They, they put doubts in a believer's heart. It, it may be due to the fact that, as Spurgeon said, he's a man. And he has a sickly mind. As much as he has a sickly body. We're broken in the, in the, in the fall of Adam. But happily, our salvation is not built on the, the fragile foundation of our emotions. Or even on the foundation of our faith. Our faith and salvation are based on the rock-solid foundation of Christ and His work of salvation, His work of propitiation and reconciliation. What He has done, we cannot undo. And it is said that Cooper's last words on his deathbed were, I am not shut out of heaven after all. I'm convinced he wasn't. The gospel of grace is wide. Paul goes on to say, it was proclaimed in all creation under heaven to all kinds of people. 
Jews and Gentiles, male and female, young and old, rich and poor, every kind of person it's been proclaimed to. The compass of Christ's sacrifice is worldwide. It's not about shutting people out, but gathering them in. It is a fountain that washes a multitude. And Christ invites people to come to Him and be washed. He invites them to come and be forgiven. In Isaiah 65, the Lord says, I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people. That's a true picture of the Lord. He is always ready to save. He saves all who trust in Him. That's His promise. Our assurance isn't based on our feelings, but on Christ's sacrifice. And the assurance that He gives us is in His Word. It's in the promise that He gives us. So, can we trust Him? Can we trust what He says? Yes, we can, because it is impossible for God to lie. Maybe there are some here who have not believed. You, you think you're okay? That you're a good liver? Like ignorance? And that will do? It won't. You are a rebel with weapons in your hands. That's the reality. So lay them down. As Paul said, be reconciled to God. Trust in Him. He receives all who do. He receives sinners and gives eternal life. May God help you to do that and help all of us to rejoice in the great grace that He has given to us. Bringing about peace where there was warfare. Making enemies His friends. Making us His children, His sons, His daughters and giving us a glorious future of purity and perfection. That's something to rejoice in. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You that uh, we who have put our faith in Your Son can rejoice in that and thank You for it because ultimately it's Your work, not our own. It's Your grace, not our merit. We have none. And men hate to hear that, and that's true of us, was true of us until you opened our eyes to see the reality as it is. And we thank you for doing that, and bringing us to yourself, bringing us to your Son, and giving us the hope of glory to come. Thank you for him, for his death, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.